webinar. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. Hi everyone, welcome to the Fall 2019 Cyber Seminar Series. Uh, just a few things before we, get, we begin, please remember that if you have any questions, to so type them into the questions box found in the GoToWebinar control panel. And as always, we will take questions after the lecture. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off to our host, Imad Habib, who will introduce today's speaker. Yeah. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Mora Borrego. You know, she's from the uh, she is the director of the Center of Engineering Education and professor of mechanical engineering and STEM education at the University of Texas Austin. Um, she is a senior associate editor and former deputy editor for a Journal of Engineering Education. She previously served as a program director at the National Science Foundation and on the board of the American Society for Engineering Education, and also as an associate dean and director for interdisciplinary graduate programs. Um, her research awards include uh, the U.S. Presidential Career, Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, uh, National Science Foundation Career Award, and two outstanding publication awards from the American Educational Research Association for uh, her journal articles. All of uh, Dr. Borg's degrees are in material science and engineering. Uh, her master's and PhD are from Stanford, and her bachelor's degree is from University of Wisconsin Medicine. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, uh, the, the topic of today's seminar. We'll learn from Mora about her research on how to um, um, improve active learning or reduce student resistance to active learning. Uh, in Quasi, we are um, very interested in uh, data-driven education and uh, how to improve um, hydrology education in general. So um, active learning is, is a, a very critical um, topic that we would like to uh, uh, learn from Mora about her recent research. So without further ado, I'll, in, I'll, I'll hand it to Mora. Okay, great, thank you, Ahmad. Um, can somebody confirm that you're seeing my slideshow the way that I probably want you to see it? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I want to do a little disclaimer about that photo. It's nice to have one when you realize that there's not going to be any video associated with the webinar, but that picture is um, pretty old. I don't really look like that anymore, but that's roughly um, the person who's talking to you today about active learning. So let's get started. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about active learning, um, and I've done research in STEM and also specific to engineering education. There's loads of research out there that says that when you actively engage students in their learning, they're going to learn better. But there's also um, a little bit less research out there to know that um, that's not enough for engineering and STEM faculty members to actually be using that and putting it into practice. Um, and if you are, if you're interested in in some of that evidence, the research evidence, I'd say that that first citation, Freeman et al., is probably a really good one to take a look at. Um, I've already uh, given a copy of these slides to the Quasi folks, so they will be archived on the website if they're not already. So you don't need to worry about taking notes today. 
But that's sort of the problem that we're trying to address is a gap between having research that says this works and um, a little bit of evidence to say that that's not enough to, to make people use it. So, so how do we address that? Okay, but um, before we really get going, I want to make sure that if I'm going to throw around this term active learning through the whole webinar that we're on the same page about what we might mean by that. So I'm going to offer a definition for our purposes today. Um, mostly during the lecture portion of class time, so not necessarily talking about labs, but asking the students to do anything other than just sit there quietly to listen to you lecture or take notes. Um, so that can mean lots of different things. Um, I'm going to show you some data that we have. I'll, I'll sort of come back to the reason why we did this study, but this was going into literature to look at people talking about active learning in their STEM classes, and this gives you a nice overview of some of the different characteristics that they t uh, talked about in their studies. So this is across all of STEM, and I would say some of those bars um, towards the top of the page are a little bit less common in engineering and maybe more common in some of the, the other disciplines like showing demonstrations at the front of the lecture class um, and, and inquiry learning and thinking about uh, how you structure lab classes, whereas some of the ones down at the bottom, like doing projects and um, working on problem solving, are the ones that I see a little bit more, com more commonly in engineering classes. Um, you can see it's also a little bit more common to ask students to work with each other as opposed to working alone, but um, either way, again, engaging students somehow with the content by thinking about a question or, or working a problem or figuring out what the next steps to working a problem would be during class time is, um, is more desirable than you just telling students what the next step is, for example. So I would like to um, get a sense of, uh, of the group here that we have today. So I want to use the poll function on, on this program, um, and I need, to, I need to launch it. And I think at this point you should be able to see it on your webinar interface um, with the same responses that I see. Um, yes, okay, so somebody figured out how to answer it, great. <coughs> So click on the poll, everybody answer, um, and then if you want to tell us a little bit more about what kinds of active learning you think you're doing um, or want to tell me a little bit more about your answer, then we can use the, the question panel for that. So I'll give you a few minutes. Okay, well, lots of people are here to learn more, um, and nobody's uh, taken my taken my request to type up in a, in the question what you're doing. But we have you know one or two folks who are who say they are doing some, and have tried things. Could you maybe tell us what are some of the things that you've tried? Okay, so I wasn't able to vote, unfortunately, uh, as a panelist, but um, I do, uh, we've, we've tried to incorporate uh, more of a hybrid style uh, with a, a particular course that I teach, um, which is sort of lent itself to opening up a lot more class time for small group interactions, a lot of uh, learning assistant facilitated uh, small group discussions and back and forth between large group and small group uh, conversations, essentially. Great. Um, and I see a couple of written responses about um, in-class problems, um, giving students spreadsheets to work through data, which I understand to be sort of the mission of Quasi here. Assigning teams to students to work on problems. Um, discussion boards in Canvas. 
HydroLearn and HydroShare for homework. Okay, good. Um, that sounds like a good variety, and I think that's that's what I'm used to talking about, which is um, having students discuss things and work on problems in class, and then um, thinking about some other ways to connect students. So we use that definition sort of going forward, and we talk about um, what are some ways to get students to do this. So um, we are addressing this problem of of student resistance to active learning. And I, I love doing research in this area because it's one of these topics that I think as soon as you tell people that that's what you're looking at, um, they can kind of understand what you're, what you're coming, uh, what you're talking about and um, probably have a story to go with it of a time that they've asked students to do something in class and the students uh, didn't want to do it or sat there like deer in the headlights or, um, you know, there's some way where it seemed like it didn't go as magically well as you wanted it to. <coughs> so I want to show you this um, uh, uh, sort of a flow a flow diagram um, that maybe in the, maybe this crowd is able to read this even better than I am necessarily, but I think the important thing I want to point you to is to looking at the numbers of where we're losing engineering faculty members in this process of trying active learning and um, not necessarily being able to sustain your use. And so you can see that of the numbers on the chart, the largest one, 35%, is associated with discontinued use. So this is people who have tried active learning or at least developed an interest in it and started learning something about it, and they stopped using it because it's not working. It's not necessarily that this is something that no one has heard of, but there's some kind of problem with the implementation, and that's where our research is really trying to help people out. So when you do ask engineering or STEM faculty, why, why aren't you doing this? If there's a lot of evidence and a lot of ideas and a lot of um, even some systems out there that you might be able to use in your classroom, why don't we see you doing more of it? And we um, very consistently get the same sets of answers. So there's um, certainly a healthy amount of skepticism that, that you know, even though it works on one set of students, it might not work on my students or my class for some, some reason that's a little bit different about the setting. Um, then there's uh, certainly the, the issue of not having a time yourself, prep time, to change around the way that you do your class because that's going to take you some time to do that. Um, so that's time out of class, but also there's not a lot of time in class because for many of us we're teaching a course that is a prerequisite for other courses and um, students really need to get through certain amounts of material and understand it really well and so you can feel like there's not enough time in class for you to slow down and have students um, try to solve a problem or, or struggle with things or, um, or, or even learn them. So, so those are issues and people have dealt with them and I have really strong opinions about those, but um, that's not what we're here for today. I'm really going to deal with the third one, which is um, if I try to do that, the students are going to hate it and they're going to take it out on me in my end of course evaluation. They might even go to my department chair to complain. And I definitely don't want that. So that's the one that we're dealing with, and that's kind of what we mean when we say student resistance to active learning. So I want to um, use the question tab again to just think about what, what that might look like when, when you ask students to do something. If I said discuss amongst yourselves um, this problem that I just put on the board, what are some ways that students might react to that that would not be... Um, the way that you wanted them to react. And we'll use the question tab again. Okay, I've got a couple responses, but I want to see more, so I'm going to give you another minute to think about it.
Okay, uh, good stuff. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got responses like refusing to participate. So you ask students to do something and they don't do it. Um, staying silent and refusing to engage with classmates. So when you ask, if you're doing something where you're asking students to get with a partner, they might um, sit quietly alone. Maybe, maybe they'll do the activity alone, but, but certainly they're not asking to do the part where you want them to get into groups. Um, looking annoyed about it, that's for sure. And then um, have a longer response. We'll sort of come back around to some of these concerns about students might not know how to get started when you ask them to do something. Um, you'd be a little bit worried about what's the right amount of time to give students. So there's definitely some fears about how to, um, how to facilitate this and how to help students understand that that's why you're doing it, that um, I'm doing this because I know that you're, you're going to learn better. There's research that says that you're going to learn better, and it's not just me being lazy and, and not being prepared for class, for example. So those are all good answers. And, and the rest of you who um, didn't actually type answers, um, good job uh, just demonstrating to us that what that looks like by not participating altogether. Um, OK, so uh, let's, um, let's talk about some of the ways that we've actually measured it in our research. Um, so yeah, students could sit quietly and work on nothing. They could mess around on their phones. Um, they could do something else, and I think you see that very often when you say, talk to your partner about the problem or about the question that I've posed to you. Um, it's, it's very easy to just talk about something else, what you did that weekend, um, or, or something completely different. Um, some students might rush through the activity, so they've, they've sort of done it, but they haven't really engaged the way that you want them to. But if, if you were to ask them you know, what was going on, they'd say, I'm done already. Um, the other one that I think is a big fear is students being really vocal. So if you say to a large room of students, um, go ahead and work on this problem, and somebody in the back of the room pipes up really loudly, this is stupid and I'm not going to do it, or, you know, or something like that. A very, very confrontational public, uh, public version of that. And I, I think for, for many of us, that could be the fear of not wanting to do active learning in our classes. But um, I, I will tell you now, and I'll tell you again sort of later when it comes up in the results, that in all of our studies in engineering classrooms, we really didn't see anything like that. Students are just as non-confrontational as we are, and, and they can be very creative about finding ways to, um, to work on something else, but, but generally they will do it in a very quiet, unobtrusive way. So, so there's at least that, that this doesn't have to be a, a super confrontational thing. And um, most of the talk we're going to get to um, some strategies to help you around that one too. Okay. Um, so in our, in our research about student resistance, this was really something that nobody had done uh, before we tried it about five years ago. So we had to really think about how, how would you measure something like this? How would you characterize it? So the first step certainly is to think about what are, you know, what are the different types of student resistance. Um, and then we had to develop some, some instruments. And uh, to be able to generate lots of data to get statistical relationships, um, you'd want to get to something that was like a, a survey that students could fill out um, because then you could you could generate a lot of data really quickly in multiple classrooms. Um, but to get there, we actually did uh, several rounds of talking to students and observing in classrooms. Um, and the one thing I just uh, I'll mention sort of as an aside about how we did the research is we used photographs like the one on this slide where you can see there's there's lots of different students and they're probably um, assigned to do a group activity and sort of validating if what we observed in class was what students thought was going on. So in some of the focus groups, we, we looked at these photos with students and said, you know, which students do you think are doing what they're supposed to be doing? And which students do you think are screwing around? And what are some ways that you've um, screwed around in class by not, not doing what the professor wanted you to do? And how, how are you feeling about that? And those kinds of things. So eventually that process got us to the point where we could ask students in a in a survey, and one version of this is a Scantron. We do the we collect the data online now, um, but it's good practice when you're doing social science kind of research to not measure things with just one question. So we have sort of multiple questions to get at things of like I didn't do the activity or uh, I did something distracting and tried to distract other students. So you can see on the slide, um, there's lots of different uh, ways that you can ask the question, and here we're also 
getting at um, some other intermediate variables of how the students felt about the activity, like I thought my instructor had my best interests in mind, and um, you know, or I thought it was busy work, or I thought the activities were value, I, I felt like the time I used was beneficial, um, those kinds of things. You can see, we, I'll talk about it later, came up with a, a sort of some relationships between how students feel about the activities and how much they're willing to engage in them, and we'll, we'll, um, we will get there today. Okay, so that's a lot of detail about what our, our dependent variable was that we measured. So how, how students are behaving in class and what we mean by student resistance. So I want to switch gears and, and think about what, um, what would be some of the independent variables. And to get you thinking about um, if I was about to show you some really awesome data that said that um, what the instructor does in class has a big impact on whether students participate or not, what are some of the variables or other predictors that you would want to know about, that you would want us to control for or account for, or could possibly explain why maybe my results are not as relevant to your setting? So think about that for a minute, and again, we'll use the, the questions tab to submit. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for the responses, which are still coming in. Um, so we've got some, some things about uh, how the instructor uses active learning and how consistent they are. Um, it might make a difference also what, what the instructor's experience level and comfort level is with either the course material or doing active learning or maybe a combination of both of those. Certainly also some characteristics of the students. If they are non-traditional age students, um, if they are used to doing these in their other classes, or maybe they're um, younger students coming from high school where they may have been used to doing these. Um, good, the reason why they're taking the course. There could be a big difference between a course, a course that's required for their major and a course that students are taking as an elective because they're a little bit more interested in it. Um, There's also a little bit here about um, how students feel about learning. If what they're, it could be their experience in other classes that, you know, does, does the learning happen um, while you're in class or does it happen when you're at home doing homework? Um, and then one other one about if you're going to ask students to work together in groups, there might be shyer students that are not comfortable with that. And I, I know that comes up a lot when we talk to instructors about how to do this. And um, Maybe at the end we can come back around to, to strategies for that. I think there are some ways to help students um, to lower the barrier there and, and help students work together. Okay, good. Um, so I will let me summarize this as um, characteristics of the students, characteristics of the course, characteristics of the instructor, and maybe characteristics of, of the ways that they're teaching the class that might be a little bit different. And, and um, things that you would definitely want to understand if you're interpreting some of the data that I'm going to show and whether that applies to your students um, at your institution and the classes that you teach. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, so the other thing we've been sort of hinting at is what the instructor does to facilitate the activities. Um, so this is, I'll show you another part of the survey that we do with the students. Um, these are some of the uh, what we've been calling strategies for how the instructor facilitates the activity. Um, and this will be clearer on some later slides, but you can see that there are things that you can do um, before the activity when you're when you are telling students what the activity is. So we already talked about um, 
making sure students understand why you're doing this. I'm not doing it because I'm lazy. I'm doing it because there's research that says that you will learn better, or I'm doing this because um, this is what it's going to be like when you're an engineer out in industry. You're going to have to work with other people, or you're going to have to solve problems like this. Um, making sure that students understand what they're supposed to do. Um, being thoughtful about planning the activity so that you have sort of the best chance of students knowing how to get started, for example, not being um, really confused when you when you set them loose to do the activity. Um, and then doing things like walking around the room so that if students have questions when they're working on it, um, it makes it a little bit easier uh, for them to stop you when you're walking by um, or, or students are sitting there alone, say, oh, did you have trouble finding a partner or do you have trouble getting started or are you done already in a, um, a less confrontational way than if you're just sitting at the front of the room. Okay, so if I skip to my, um, some of the main research findings that I want to go through that are coming out of this, um, the first I mentioned uh, earlier, you rarely see that really open confrontational student yelling you know, in the in the middle of class in front of everybody that that I don't want to do this activity. They're much more likely to put their heads down and and not do it or do something else. Um, but I think that that biggest fear for it being really scary and confrontational that's um, not necessarily going to happen. Okay, we were able to measure student resistance in terms of three separate outcomes. So there's a, a chunk of questions about whether students participated in the activity and really um, engaged fully and, and put forth their best effort. A chunk of questions about whether they were distracted or did things to distract other students. And then um, we also added questions, I didn't really show these on the slides, but things like, I plan to give the instructor a lower score on the end of course evaluation kind of questions on there to measure that. So there's three different ways that we're measuring that. Three different dependent variables I'll show you data for in, a, in another slide. Um, and among all these things that we talked about, the last uh, question we did where I was asking you for responses, characteristics of the students, characteristics of the instructor, characteristics of the course. Um, and we sampled pretty broadly uh, 17 different engineering classes across the United States. Um, mostly these like sophomore level engineering science courses, but there's a couple mixed in there that were um, pretty project based also across all engineering disciplines um, and and measure and, and and in the statistical models put in these characteristics that, that you see on the slide, the gender of the student, the gender of the instructor and, and everything else on there. And in the regression models, the most significant predictor actually was the degree to which the students noticed the professor did those things like explain the activity and walk around the room and answer questions. So that's really good news because you as an instructor have very little control over the characteristics of your students or the course you're assigned to teach or characteristics of yourself really, uh, the ones that we're talking about. But you do have loads and loads of control about how you design the activities, how you present the activities to students, and what you're doing while students are doing the activities. And, it, and I think it's also something that you can learn and you can improve upon. Um, it's just important to get over that hump of maybe the first time you're doing it, it's not so great. Okay. So here's some, uh, some more interesting data slides for folks who are waiting for them. So again, those three different outcomes, participation, Distraction and evaluation and distraction because that's a negative thing you want to um, you want that to be reduced and so that's why the bars are, are sort of going down below zero. Um, so for all six of the relationships that we're testing, they're statistically significant, so that's why you have the three stars there. Um, and on the this old version of the survey, we had the two categories: how well you explain the activity, that's the yellow bar, and the darker bar um, is. Uh, what you're doing while the students are, are, are working. Are you walking around the room? Are you checking your phone? Um, so you can see in each case the bar for facilitation is a little bit bigger. Um, so certainly explaining activity, making sure students know what to do is important, but how you actual students are working on the activity can be even more important. So um, I I've been there and, I, and I've done it too. There's a, a day where you're trying to get your proposal in by five o'clock and, and in class you're, you ask the students to do something so you quickly, you know, you check your phone and make sure that you don't have any emails where they're catching something that's, you know, poorly formatted and that you're going to have to fix it and, and you're distracted. Um, but I, 
try to take the lap around the room and talk to students. And if, if I'm asking them to actively engage in class, make sure that I'm actively engaging in class during that time. And that can make a huge difference. Some other data that I want to show you before we get into the, the more of the details of the um, of the strategies is uh, after we did all of this research, developing instruments and studying uh, 17 classrooms, and, and you accumulate about a thousand um, data points from students for those relationships I showed you on the previous slides. We also went into the literature to see um, can we see this some of these same trends in the literature. So this is looking at, you know, papers where people are primarily writing about the active learning that they're doing in their classes, but also have at least a little side comment or something about how much the students liked or did not like the activity or what aspect of the activity they did or didn't like and those types of things. And so there's certainly going to be some publication bias involved there, but I don't think it's as extreme if the primary purpose of these papers is really to talk about the active learning and whether cognitively students have learned more as opposed to the affect of, of, of how they felt about it. So I think there's a, there's a more side comments and advice for other instructors on how to do this. Um, but still, we saw a really overwhelmingly positive uh, student reaction. And because we have uh, here 412 data points, it, it, that's 412 papers, each one is a data point with characteristics, again, of the course level and what type of active learning they did and characteristics of the instructor and the discipline and those types of things. And you run the statistics, and again, you don't see any statistically significant differences. So I think there's some there's some stable results here. Um, and you can also see it's mostly uh, overwhelmingly positive. Um, we just got a journal article accepted that looked at those papers that are a little bit negative or or mixed results, and I think that's, again, getting back to how students feel about the activity. If they really understand why they're doing it and how it's going to help them learn and how it's going to help them do better in class, um, that, that that's probably the, the biggest explanation that you're seeing for why students don't like it. So it's really important to help them understand those things. Okay. Um, so we have several articles. The citations are on the left slide if you want to dig them up after um, after the webinar. Um, so now we're really just going to talk about the strategy. So uh, there were there were two categories that we had in the data, and there's sort of a third one that came in with some of the, the other research that we've done. So the first one is explanation strategy. So this is when you are introducing the activity to students. So definitely ex explain that that you know why you're doing this. So I I'm doing this because I think that you learn better, not because I'm not doing my job. Um, how does this relate to learning? This is going to help you learn. It's going to help you do better on exams, or it's going to prepare you to do your homework. It's not just a, a a break from the regular main business of our class. If it makes sense, also talk about how this relates to their engineering practice when they get out. Um, make sure that students understand what you want them to do for the activity. So it could be at the end of two minutes, I want you to have a number, or I want you to have an equation, or I want you to have a diagram. So it would help to explain students what you know what are they producing. Sometimes you're asking quick quick questions, and it doesn't make sense to go into that much detail. Make sure the students understand that it's it's not just an extra thing. Depending on um, how you're you're grading for the courses, if you have an attendance grade or a participation grade, that participation means coming to class and participating in these activities, and not just sitting quietly and doing them instead. And that that's important to you. Um, an interesting result that we had when we we surveyed students and surveyed their instructors is that we found that many students thought that they were actually getting part of their course grade based on participating in activities. And a few of their instructors were said, I don't know where that's coming from because that's not the case. I mean, it's it's tightly coupled because if they do the activities, they will do better in the class. But it's not like students are handing in a worksheet and I'm giving them points for that worksheet. So it's possible that students will, will get that impression, which is uh, probably not the worst thing in the world. It also helps to tell students how long you think the activity would take. So they think, take five minutes to work on this problem, or take two minutes, or 
let's work on it for five minutes and I'll see where you're at and I'll let you know if we're going to work on it for longer. If you have a really long explanation before you send the students uh, free to work on the activity, then you might um, ask them if they have any questions before they get started. And then you send them off. Um, facilitation is an important one because this is what's happening during class time. Um, we have a laundry list of activities that I will share with you, um, but I want you to think about it a little bit more. So um, I'll give you a couple and then I want you to sort of think about how you might expand on these and make them more specific or if they um, sort of trigger some other ideas for you. So my favorite, I think maybe of all of the strategies, is make sure that you walk around the room when the students are doing activity and that you walk all the way to the back of the room. Because if you think about it, we, we do it too. You go to a meeting and you don't really want to be fully engaged in the meeting or you have something else to do. So you bring your computer and you sit all the way in the back of the room because that's, people aren't necessarily going to see that you aren't working on it or they're not going to, um, they're not going to call you out, those kinds of things. So if you walk, even if you have the kind of room where you cannot get between the rows, to, to talk to the students that are in the middle of the room, just taking that lap all the way around the back. If there's an aisle, uh, typically for for the fire to satisfy the fire marshal, there is there's that option. Um, just your physical proximity can wake students up. Um, it can signal to them that you realize that they're not working on the activity. It just it makes it a little bit more likely that students will put more effort in. And then again, students who are confused can flag you down and ask you a question when they might be a little um, too embarrassed to raise their hand and ask the question in front of everyone in the whole class. Um, another important one would be to sort of um, finish up the activity in some way. So I, I think, again, when you're you're busy and you're thinking about getting through everything in the class period, you, you could occasionally ask students to discuss a problem with their neighbor and then just you know call them back and go right back into your next lecture without saying, you know, can two or three students raise their hands and let me know what you talked about? So um, just giving students the answer or talking about how there's not an answer or talking about why you had them do this, say, I know we didn't really have time to finish, but I wanted you to give a little time to think about it. Just something that sort of acknowledges um, the effort that students have put into the activity before you move on. Um, and then at, at different points, ask students for feedback about how it's going. So I, I don't know if you have to use a ton of class time for this, but there are th there's ways to do mid-semester surveys um, or to talk to the students that are there earlier that stay later that come to your office hours about how they think things are going and help you think about um, how to improve them. So let's um, take a break here for, for two minutes and think about um, – what other ideas this sparks about facilitation, and we'll use the question uh, tab for that again. Maura, I don't know, maybe you can uh, use a full mode, uh, full screen mode. I'm not sure if you are doing that already. Are you guys seeing the answer? Is that what's going on? I think we can see the next slide, you know. <laughs> okay. I thought, yeah. But you, I guess you are not using the full screen mode or something. I'm not sure. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've, got two, I've got two monitors. Um, Okay. okay. Well, that's an example of how not to do active learning. If you want students to, to actively engage, I will, I'll give you all a free pass on that. So let me make that big enough so that you can actually see it. Okay. 
so this is um, fleshing out some of the ideas uh, that we had on the previous slide. Um, walking around the room, um, there's a lot of controversy around approaching or confronting students who are not working on the activity. I think a lot of people are not very comfortable with that. So that's why I think walking around the room helps quite a bit. But but there are also some very gentle ways of doing that to say, um, are you having trouble find, do you ha finding a partner? Um, why don't you get up and move two seats down so you can work with this other student who also doesn't seem to have a partner? Or are you done already? Or are you having trouble getting started? Or what, what do you think the first step should be? Or, you know, things like that that aren't, um, why aren't you working on the activity? Or why are you being so lazy? Um, but just nudge students a little bit and, and help them understand that you care about them doing the activity. Um, I think the you know the body language stuff again is not uh, not taking your phone and then going to the corner of the room, but walking around. Um, if you're in a room that has some empty seats, you could even sit down with the students. That makes you a little more approachable than than standing over them, looming over them. Um, you could give students points for the activity. So we talked about worksheets worksheets earlier. If you're um, uh, you might have them fill something out and hand it in at the end of class. Um, I think it's it's probably more important to do them like participation points than correct answer points where you could do the activity but still get zero credit. So um, so I, I would do the participation points instead. Um, make sure that you're uh, wrapping up the activity. Um, give students an appropriate amount of time. I want to talk about that for a minute because somebody mentioned in the in the question tab that they were really concerned about that. You, you're going to have students who can do it really quickly because um, they're caught up on all their work for the class and there's another set of students that's going to have trouble getting started and is not going to get through the activity and that's that's okay. Um, that's another reason why it's good to walk around. You can see when students are done. Um, you can even, if you do this a lot, you can hear uh, just the volume level in the room will be, it'll be steady, 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 and they'll go, it'll dip for a little while when a lot of students are done, and then it'll start going back up again when they start talking about other things. And that's um, a really good time to end the activity. Um, but also, it's not necessarily that all students need to be able to finish uh, the, you know, the problem or whatever that you're working on. It's important that they just had time to think about it enough so that they are primed for the answer when you give it to them. They're invested in the answer. And it might be important to mention that to students, that that this isn't about me always giving you enough time to work on the whole activity, it's about giving you enough time to, to consider it. Um, and I already mentioned that you can solicit feedback in uh, informal and informal ways from the students. That's going to help you think about whether it worked or not. Okay. And then the last chunk is um, the planning and feedback. So this is, um, you can't just the morning of class think this would be a really interesting question to make my students talk about during class. Um, you have to think about how, how it would fit in with the rest of class. So if you're going to tell students that we are doing this because it helps you learn and because it's going to help you do better on your exam, um, then, then you should probably come up with activities that actually do that. And that takes time and energy on your part and, and reflection. So, um, when I when I do my teaching, I find it so much easier to spend a few minutes um, after not every single class period, but after large projects and at the end of the semester to make notes to myself while it's still fresh in my mind about what I want to change for next year. Because the whole year later, you're not going to remember what worked and what didn't work. So um, spending a little bit of time and thinking about how you might want to do things differently. Um, couple of others I want to point out too. Plan activities involve everyone's participation. So um, there's a couple different ways to do this. You can get really creative with, uh, you know, who needs to report back or who needs to write down the answer or, or those kinds of things. Um, but you definitely don't want to give students an activity or a project that you've assigned four students to do, but one person could do it really easily on their own. Something that's big enough and hard enough that really requires multiple students to work on. Um, I think it also helps to have a routine so that students understand that at least for this class, it could be different from all of your other classes, but for this class, when you come to class, expect that there's going to be at least one activity every class period. Um, 
And if you use similar activities, then that also shortens the time it takes for you to explain them to students. There's, it's possible to get in a rut, and, and you might want to change it up a little bit. But if you say, you know, every class period you come in and there's a worksheet where we're going to work on problems together, that also can make it a little bit easier for students to engage. Um, and then if you're going to do really big things, think about structuring it into small steps. And that, that might be something more like a, a project that takes um, you know, multiple class periods or multiple weeks for students to do that. What are, what are some of the intermediate steps that would help students get there? That reduces the chances that they'll be completely lost and overwhelmed. Okay, um, so we're just done a, a couple wrap-up slides and then we can switch over to questions. Um, but I did, I did mention um, how students feel about the activity, so I want to be just a little bit clearer about that. We've been treating this a little bit like a black box where um, instructors do some things in class and then students magically participate in the activities. And we're starting to understand that how students feel about the instructor and the activities and about learning is really the reason why you get them to participate. So helping them um, understand that you care about their learning, that you're doing this because uh, research tells us that it's going to help them learn, and um, maybe there's, you know, you could mention that it's actually not, it's actually not easier for you to do, to ask the students to active learning because it takes just as much preparation time for you to figure out what kinds of activities the students are going to do and that they're the right activities for the students. Um, and that's it. I just have, you know, a couple sort of handout kinds of things. But again, these are going to be on the website. So we have the citations to the articles. Um, and these are really in the order that I think you would want to read them. So if you're going to read one article, read the first one. Um, and then I have loads of collaborators. So uh, I'm going to end there and um, let us switch over to questions. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to utilize the questions box um, so we can move forward with that. I'll give everyone a few minutes. So it looks like we have one um, asking, what is a good breakdown between students who are moving quickly versus slowly? For example, 70% of the class completely done. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I haven't thought about it that way. I think, um, you know, what I was saying about the volume in the room probably does correspond to something like 70 or 80% 80, 80 of the students getting it done. Um, you can also sort of add a, um, like a bonus, like if you've, you know, if you finish that, start thinking about this other aspect of the problem or what, you know, what it would be if we changed some aspect of the problem so that the students, when they, when they finished, have something else to work on. Um, but it really depends on the nature of what, what you're asking them to do, too. So I think, I think walking around the room and seeing where students are at um, can give you a really good sense. It also, it, it helps you catch um, if everybody's stuck on the same thing and make a quick announcement, if everybody's confused about the same one instruction or one, or one detail. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Anybody have anything else they'd like to ask before we move forward? Um, well, I see, you know, I see some comments from, from earlier um, about how you deal with introverted students or shy students who, who don't have friends or don't necessarily want to work with each other. Um, I think doing things like a, assigning students to groups. Um, you know, so that every, everybody has someone that they have to work with. So it's not like um, find a friend, and if you don't have any friends in this class, you know, then too bad. Um, if if you're willing to do some matchmaking on on short term things, if you just say turn turn to your neighbor and you walk around the room and you're seeing students who are sitting alone and um, 
again, most students will do it if you say, oh, could you get up and move two rows forward so that you can sit with this other student and work together? That works. Um, but I've also, I've heard of instructors doing things like um, they have students uh, make a clock. So there's 12, uh, 12 points on the clock and they have to meet 12 people in their class and they write down their names. And then the professor says, okay, this is a, we're going to call this a four o'clock appointment. So for this this problem for the next two minutes, find your four o'clock person and sit with them to work on the problem. So I, th I think, you know, adding those structures like, like building in teams, assigning teams to students, so not always just letting students pick their own folks um, can help them get to know at least a couple students in class. And may maybe they won't study with them outside of class or make friends or anything. But when you say we're going to work on group things in class, they do have someone to work with. Okay, thanks, Mara. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? Insui, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I could not type it in the question box, I'm sorry, but... Um, oh, okay, that's okay. And it's a two-part question, actually, Mora. So, um, did you uh, did your research also cover, like, out-of-class active learning activities? I mean, um, or is it just about the in-class activities? Uh, and oh. the second part of my question is, uh, is, there, is there also like, um, instructor resistance to active learning, just like there are for students? <laughs> yeah. Um, we've been focusing mostly on in-class, but projects are a pretty big part of engineering education, so it's hard to ignore those completely. Um, and then your second question about instructor resistance, you know, absolutely. And um, our, our strategy has been, um, you know, to do this research, to come up with some, uh, some different type of data because um, that review article at the very beginning is, you know, tons and tons and tons of articles that show that active learning helps students learn. But there's, um, I mean, really, in, in any walk of life, I think just showing people data, there's no, you know, there's never going to be the, the magic bar chart that just convinces people and they'll completely change their views on on anything. It's a, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So so getting at some of the different concerns. So even though we're um, we're throwing data and research at it and, and trying to come up with practical things, um, we're coming at at least one of the angles. Right. This is addressing these students are going to hate it and take it out on me on my course evaluations. Thank you. So it looks like we have another question that just came in um, asking or saying I've had students who have actually told me that they would have anxiety attacks if they were required to work with other students and was even told by student services that I would need to have them work alone. I have had this happen twice, and in both cases, the students did considerably worse in the class. How do you adapt to such cases? Wow. Um, I, I've never heard of that. Um, I would personally, um, at some point want to talk to the student services folks and maybe bring bring some of that evidence to say that there's there's research studies that say the students would do better but honestly I've been through this two times now and the students um, don't do as well so uh, you know can we can we talk about you imposing this requirement on me or or could you help me understand a little bit better where the students coming from and if there are some ways to lessen the anxiety for that student um, in terms of class, I mean, if you're doing things like, um, pro you know, projects or problems and you want students to work in groups, then you're, I guess you're coming up with an accommodations version that's not, maybe not as complex that students can work on, you know, on their own to turn in. So you can think about how to scale that back. Perfect. And in the essence of time, it uh, looks like we can take one more question if anyone has anything to add. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything come through, so we'll go ahead and move forward with 
um, some quasi related things. Okay, so we have a few upcoming events and deadlines we want everyone to uh, be aware of. So the first deadline is the Pathfinder Fellowship. Uh, the Pathfinder Fellowship is something awarded to graduate students in hydrology and related fields to make an extended trip um, to enhance the research um, by adding a field site to conduct comparative research. So the deadline for this is actually this Friday, October 11th. So there are just a few more days left to get uh, your applications in for this. Um, and the next we have, uh, there's actually a free workshop taking place before the AWRA conference next month. Um, so the workshop is November 3rd from 1 to 5 p.m. And if you're interested, you can find out more information on Quasi social media and uh, Quasi's website. And then finally, we have another fellowship opportunity. So uh, Quasi's Hydroinformatics Innovation Fellowship. Um, this fellowship is awarded to support a hydroinformatics product that will be disseminated to the Quasi community. And awardees can earn up to $5,000 for eligible expenses. Um, the application deadline for this is actually this Friday, October 11th as well. So there's not much time to get these in, um, but you still have you still have a few days. Um, and if anybody has any questions or concerns about either one of these, you can contact John Pollock um, at Quasi to find out more. And then there's also more information on the website as well. Uh, so with that, we want to thank everyone for joining us today, and we hope that you join us next week, um, where we'll be joined by Corey Forbes, who will be talking about teaching and learning about hydrological systems in an introductory undergraduate water course. Thank you, everyone.